All right, here we go. Recording, I love recording. I do a lot of work with recording. Uh, recording is great, I love audio. But uh, during the Industrial Revolution from about 1820 to about 1840, there was a rise in attempts to record speech and music, the likes of which had never been seen before. About 111 years ago, this guy, John Philip Sousa, predicted that recordings would lead to the demise of music. But now we know that his prediction, however dire, failed to come true. Music, and tech, uh, music, technology, and recordings are omnipresent. There's millions of hours available online, as you know, and many other mediums give us a place to store and remember audio. But the problem is, is it's a ghostly, like, virtual medium now, where the experience of holding an album in one's hand is a lost experience, and, and the lifetime of a recorded format is quite finite. Um, you know, what has recording actually done to music? Like, how did we get here? Was Sousa's predictions doom or the reality of the recording world a boom to, to new sounds only to be lost in time as formats change and our preservation efforts fail? Of course, maybe you're like me. Um, maybe you're one of the technological utopians, and I'm, I, I know I'm one of those. Um, and I'll tell you that recording has not imprisoned music, but it's absolutely liberated it and allowed us to do things with sound and time that we could never, ever do before. We've, we've brought an art that was once elite to the masses, and this art that maybe might be on the fringes more to the center. And, you know, before Edison came along, the only way you were going to hear Beethoven symphonies would be to go to a concert hall, pay a lot of money, and put on some fancy clothes. And, you know, to think of all the virtually unknown hipster indie bands that some of you may only have discovered <laughs> on streaming sites, and I know you haven't heard of them because I haven't. <laughs> but it's just me. It's only for me. The first device that could actually record sounds as they passed through the air was this thing called the phonautograph. And it was patented in 1857 by a Parisian inventor named Edward Leon Scott de Martinville. And this thing uh, basically put a reed up against a uh, sheet of glass. And that sheet of glass was covered in carbon black or lamp black, which you could manufacture quite easily by holding a sheet of glass above a candle. Um, and it was an analog of the human ear. It had a diaphragm. It was connected to a stylus. The bristle would move across the carbon black and that sound was collected by this sort of simulated ear. The problem is, is that no playback was possible. And it was, a, <laughs> because it was a line on glass, and this was our first extinct audio recording format. <laughs> totally useless. Um, by 1877, another guy, uh, Charles Cross, had realized that a phonograph recording could be converted back into sound if you could only find a way to engrave the groove into a metal surface or another surface and reverse the recording process. And of course, like all the good inventions of this time, before he was able to put anything back into practice, along comes Thomas Edison to steal his idea. Because this is what Edison does, just like he did to Tesla back in the day. You know? Yeah. Woo! Uh, that was, oops, whoa, skip my slides. So this was the birth of like the, the acoustic era. So we have an ability now to take an acoustic sound, take the sound, put the sound onto a surface, and replay the surface by playing back the vibrations. But a lot of people didn't really understand how that process worked. We had no amplification. Sounds were very quiet, very thin. And let me just see, he's still a dick, even though I, if I show the slide twice. So that's the acoustic era. And that was our invention of the wax cylinders. It was our early invention of the sort of Edison phonograph. But at the time, no one really thought that you would use this for music because Edison was all about the paper. All he wanted to do was get out there and make more and more and more money selling this to business people to preserve the human word and get rid of the stenographers to make more money. The, the sound was so quiet, you could only really record music by having these massive horns. And this is the, the Victor Orchestra. And all of this took place sort of before 1925, before we saw one of the most amazing inventions, which was the amplifier. And the amplifier, woo! Yes. Uh, the amplifier creates sort of the second wave of sound recording, where it, it allows us to create a hybrid process, where you can take a sound, capture it, amplify it, filter it, balance it, mix it, sample it, loop it, fuck it, and eat it, as Papa Lee did say. Um, but actually, sampling comes later in the digital age. Um, but the signal was still physically inscribed into a disc. And it's the conventional record that we all know and love. So this is a, a pyral record, which was actually pressed onto glass. It's an incredibly fragile format. And it was done because things like Bakelite and acetate were not really available uh, once the wars really started going. Um, so you press something onto glass, it's completely useless. 
uh, because if you drop this, it's going to break. If you try to preserve it, it's going to shatter. But the one thing that sort of comes from this time, which is really incredible, is these two amazing objects. <clears throat> one is the microphone, much like this guy, and one is the speaker. This design has not changed since 1925. A microphone is a speaker in reverse, and a speaker is a microphone in reverse. It's, it's pretty amazing. This creates the electroacoustic world that you know and love. So even your tiniest iPod headphones have the, exactly the same technology that you have in this device. Still the same since 1920. Now, once we beat the shit out of the Germans, <clears throat> and then we took their wonderful, wonderful invention of magnetic tape, we were able to enter a new era which was the magnetic era, which is about 1945 to about 1975. It's the third wave. Suddenly we can edit, we can move things around, we can reduce the size of objects, and we can replay stuff in a much higher fidelity from about 6,000 hertz all the way to 20 kilohertz and cover the majority of the human hearing spectrum on a single piece of magnetic tape. There were similar technologies like the wire recorder. <coughs> um, the wire recorder did the same thing, but it recorded to a piece of wire. And it was a very durable technology, so some of the earliest flight recorders used wire recording. And, and that was around 1848 it was developed, but we didn't really see it get into full use until the beginning of the 1940s. The interesting thing is, is that with so much change going on in technology, extinction and obsolescence comes along with the problem. Formats come and go, but along the way we lose more and more and more recordings. And this is a short list in incredibly tiny, impossible to read font and I apologize for that, of about 108 formats that went obsolete. And as the format goes away, also the knowledge of how to read the format is, is lost as well. In the 80s, we had the digital era where we tried to take sound and put it onto a CD. So 1975 to the present day, we have been in the digital era. We thought that by putting our trust in the digital world, <clears throat> we would be able to reproduce and recreate sound and play it forever. Uh, promises on this medium were anywhere from 20 years to 40 years. And not so true because we currently see CDs suffering disc rot, small pits, the aluminum uh, degrades, and the process of moving the data from the digital medium or an analog, analog medium through a computer to a digital medium, uh, you're still at risk of losing more data because if the format changes or the hardware changes, you can't read the data anymore. So modern recordings that have been born digital like music originally streamed on, I don't know, MySpace, is incredibly ephemeral. And keeping track of music that's in a digital format is an active process. It's not passive. Every time we move that information from, from one place to another, we have to maintain the format, maintain the file system, and continue to have the ability to read the format. Those of you familiar with Alexander Rose, who's from the Long Now Foundation, he'll, he'll tell you that things written on stone a thousand years ago, we can still read. Things that were written 20 or 30 years ago digitally, they're gone. We can't read them anymore. But the really interesting thing is, every time we lose a format, someone fetishizes it. So that's, that's kind of neat. Whatever you thought was weird or ugly or uncomfortable, like the shitty 8-bit video games, that's pretty cool right now. You know, people using old recordings, old distortion, the vinyl scratch being recreated in the digital realm. These are all things that we do now with modern plugins. And all of the plugins that exist in a computer suffer, whoa, go back. I wasn't ready for that. Um, all the plugins that exist in a modern computer suffer from this type of skeuomorphism. And every single one tries to look like the past. And this is kind of what my Pro Tools desktop looked like when I was working on my last album. It's crazy. All right, so the nice thing is, is that valuable recordings and rare tapes have, even though they've vanished over the years, we do have this wonderful thing called the National Recording Preservation Foundation, and they try to stop this process by recreating and rebuilding things. And the, the answer to many things might not be digitizing them, it might actually be recreating and bringing back the hardware that could once play them. So they're a fantastic society, and they are funded by your tax dollars, and Jack White's money, who put in about a quarter million dollars. So that's pretty sweet. Yay, Jack White. Um, and sometimes we get to get file formats back from the dead. So this is a resurrection of Apollo video where they were able to rebuild the tapes and, and put things back and get a much higher quality image than what was possible before. But discussing image formats is a whole other talk and we'll, we'll, we'll skip that. Um, so the one thing is, is, as I said before, the layman's view, digital is a safe place to go. It is not a safe place to go because you have to keep moving things forward forever to maintain those formats. Even Edison cylinders, you touch them with your fingers now and they dissolve under the, the heat, the human heat. Sometimes, though, sometimes we get to get formats back. And 
Vinyl has made quite a comeback in the last few years, thanks to these guys, the hipsters. <clears throat> they love vinyl, and they have certainly brought vinyl back from the dead, thanks to things like National Record Store Day. Hipsters, yay! So, I don't have a drink with me for some strange reason, but I would like to raise a toast, perhaps a piece of poop. Oh, wait, I'm getting a drink delivered. This is... Hey! Yay, booze. So a toast to the engineers, the artists, and the scientists who are trying to preserve sound for ours and for future generations. Thank you. I still have to take the poop. <laughs>